Hi, I'm Julia. Welcome to the Mind Matters panel. Now, I quite liked high school. I liked the structure, I had some good friends, and there were a few teachers that made me feel great. They made me feel intelligent and strong. That was a great gift. As it happened, my first job out of acting school was with the Bell Shakespeare Company, touring high schools, performing to huge gyms full of students and trying to get them into Hamlet. And doing that job for years, what I noticed was that you could see and feel the environments that were helping students flourish or leaving them struggling. And it wasn't just about posh schools or poor schools, bad teachers, good teachers. To me, it seemed like simple things, talking and listening and laughter. They were the keys to creating a flourishing school. So in the spirit of that, I am delighted to be here with some great panellists to talk about how schools can improve mental health. Helping us to get started are Young and Well Cooperative Research Centre Managing Director, Dr Michael Cargreg, Principals Australia Institute Executive Consultant, Tracy Zilm, Deputy Principal Rob Blackley, and School Psychologist, Sarah Innes. But first, Let's take a look at an example of how the enthusiastic staff at Eagleton High School started their journey with Mind Matters. We've been doing Mind Matters here at Eagleton High School for the last two years and the results have been fantastic. It's really improved school culture. But a strategy doesn't just implement itself. You need a driver. And for us, that driver is Tricia. Tricia is one of our history teachers and she's become our Mind Matters guru. She's passionate, she's knowledgeable, and as I like to say, as long as Trish is on the scene, mental health at Eagledon is on the up and up. Having a bit of a tidy up, are we, Trish? I'm going on maternity leave. How long have you been pregnant? Um, eight and a half months. Ah. <laughs> a strategy doesn't just implement itself. You need a team so that it doesn't just rest on a single point of failure. Hey! Oh, Trish, no, <laughs> I didn't mean you, I promise. I was just explaining that you need a team. Hey, Phil, I'll join your mental health thing. Oh, good on you, Eugene, that's great. <laughs> Looks like we've got to start. I'll join your mental health thing too, Phil. It's just water. Mm. Delicious. Now, look. Seriously, why is it important to have a team when trying to strengthen mental health and wellbeing across the school community? Well, I think Tricia highlights that. People leave. Um, you often have one or two people in a school who are our wellbeing warriors, who, who are really enthusiastic about wellbeing and willing to drive that cause, but other things in life come up and they leave, they move schools or go and have families or unfortunately get sick. So to have a team, there's always going to be other people around who can drive that message forward. And my matter is you need that, that message to continue going. It's no good just starting and stopping. You want it to be sustainable. So a team will continue that, that message over time. And it's also... Um, represents a whole range of people within the college. So you're not just old school. So it's not just about one person's point of view. And because we, we need to represent staff and students and parents and the whole school community, it's very varied. So a team can address that. Is there a best team composition, Tracy? I think the point that you make about making it a diverse team is probably the best because when we talk about mental health, those people who might be struggling at any point in time are often more marginalised. And if you're talking about a whole school approach to wellbeing, the more voices that you can get on a team that's planning what you're going to do about that and what might need to happen, often you don't hear from some of those people. Mm -hmm. If you have staff from across roles in a school is really important. If you have um, a variety of parents who are involved and keen to involve other parents. If you have the voice of young people themselves who they're the ones that really know what's going on and what, be, what might be needed. So mm -hmm. you don't want a team that's too big, mm -hmm. um, but you do want representation and that representation will look different in each environment. You know, so schools to those passionate people who mm. get it started and it'll probably start small. And what's the principal's role in all of this? The principal has to be across what it is that's trying to be done, what mental health is and what it looks like in a school and why you would pick it up and take it forward because we know that if you are looking after young people's wellbeing, they're going to achieve better, they're going mm. to attend school and engage mm. and they're, you know, their learning's going to be improved. And let's face it, that's what school's there for. Sometimes if the principal's the only driver, mm. it, it maybe doesn't go as well. And so having an executive leadership 
person who's going to, to drive it forward is important, but it certainly needs the principal to be aware of it, encouraging it, because it's going to require resources and time and um, kudos across mm. the school mm. community. Mm. And if your principal's saying this is important and we're going to invest time and effort into it, then people go, oh, OK. Mm. Well, teachers have a lot to do already and it seems to be increasing all the time. How do you recruit, Rob? How do you get people, teachers, everyone interested in maybe wanting to be on My Matters? For a start, the, the team's more than just your counsellors or your psychologists. There would be other staff members out there who have a genuine interest and passion but they just they may not have been having the, had that opportunity to or invited to be part of it. So it's actually taking it out to the staff and if there is support coming from leadership uh, and it's seen as being important, that then encourages staff to see, OK, this is a priority of the school, this is something that I'm really interested in, this is something that I'd actually like to be involved in. Uh, you will probably, I, I think you will find that there will be staff happy to put their hand up and, I, and also saying that there would be students who would, be like, who would like to be part of that team also. I think it's important that staff understand um, what it is that you're talking about when you're talking about a whole school approach to mental health because they do have a lot of excellent practice and they have been doing... They've been building relationships with kids. That's part of learning, for example. Um, but you need to make sure that your staff understand that you're not asking them to teach a new curriculum, for example, and you're not asking them to necessarily change their practice. You're just building their awareness. And, and we often talk to schools about putting on mental health promotion glasses so that you're just starting to look at what you do as your normal practice um, through mental health promotion lens so that you take away some maybe their fear of it and improve their understanding of what mental health is and what it looks like in a classroom and a school and, and what positive relationships look like in terms of of learning. When you're recruiting though, Sarah, are there barriers to overcome? Of course. Um, the barrier, the very big one is that I think we've mentioned already is that teachers are very time poor. They're not just, um, you know, able to just pick up and, and make time in their timetable. Uh, they're running from one thing to another and barely managing to get lunch. So uh, I think um, feeling like it's another extra thing on top of everything else they're doing, it's really important to send the message to them that that's not the case. And in our school, we decided when we were starting to recruit staff was that we wanted them to be very clear that we were out. there was something they would get out of this as well. And that's still part of what we do. We have a staff representative, so the person on our, on our action team is there to think about staff wellbeing and how we can continue to promote that and then model it to our students. So that's one of the barriers I think is definitely that senior leadership can help with and that certainly helped us. Michael, would you agree? Yeah, I do. I, I think a lovely way to think about this is getting staff to remember that the way they come across to students is vital. Mm. So you've got to actually look after yourself. For me, Mind Matters has always been about giving schools this whole of school approach where we've got policies, practices and curriculum material which basically all talk about trying to create this environment where people feel safe, valued and listened to. But teaching is not an exercise in martyrdom. Mm. What we actually mm. have to do is look after ourselves and I don't think some, school, some teachers with great respect are very good at that. Mm. I think and they need to get better. Mm. Eventually it becomes a way of operating. Schools that have implemented Mind Matters in really concerted ways talk about it's just the way we do things around here. Mm. And it starts to filter in. And I think that the, the, one of the barriers is doing too much too quickly. Mm. Mm. And that wears everybody yes. out. Yep. Um, and so, you know, the schools who are uh, successful often chip away, mm -hmm. drip feed, and know that they're planning for this to be a long-term yeah. change. And we know that you actually have to think about change management because you're trying mm. to change mm. the culture of it. A school. And that's that's true, isn't it? Like, there will be resistance and that's a really fundamental thing to remember. Yeah, so overcoming that. I know of a school who used the approach, they had about seven or eight people on their, their action team. They knew that resist, there was a lot of resistance, there was a lot of um, talk in the staff room that was being overheard. And what they decided to do was split the entire staff up, went and had a one-on-one -on -one chat. Mm. This is what we're trying to do. Tell me about what is worrying you. What, mm. you know, what would it take for you to feel that you could be on board with this? So, and then they all came back together and shared. These are the sorts of things that people are saying. And they mm. were able to say, well, so what are we going to do about that? This is reality. What are some strategies you might put in place to increase a school's commitment to student mental health and wellbeing? The wonderful thing that I've seen recently in schools is an emphasis on sleep, exercise and mindfulness. And it's really amazing how 
kids need nine hours sleep, according to the latest research. Sadly, they're not getting that. They're getting about 5.5 hours, according to some research. 5.5? There's a fantastic school uh, which recently got hold of a TED talk by the world expert on sleep. His, his name is Professor Russell Foster from Oxford University. And they played it to the kids. And then the kids formed a committee to figure out what they were going to do. And they coined a term, beducation. So they had a beducation <laughs> week. These kids rang up Captain Snooze and Captain Snooze put up a bed for a week and they had a sleep week. Um, the school also went to uh, one of the popular sleep trackers, uh, Jawbone, oh, and these oh, normally you got a sleep tracker, yes, my Michael. darling, I can show you. How... Can do you want to put it on? Yeah, yeah are you feeling sleepy? It's on. Um, what this does is it literally tracks sleep while you're what, tracks your sleep cycles, and what they did is they managed to get a bulk order. So the school actually got them for about ten bucks, distributed them to the kids who paid the ten bucks, which is better than one hundred and forty nine, which is what you pay in the shops. And suddenly, all these kids were aware of how important sleep was. They used other apps apps like Smiling Mind to teach these kids mindfulness. And they used another app called Couch to 5K to actually teach these kids how important it was to exercise. So in terms of boosting mental health, you've hit the three big ones there that we as psychologists are constantly talking about. You're doing our job for us. It's fantastic. Mm. And I think one of the keys is in developing the strategies that you might use the examples of where students have come up with ideas, I think it's the way that you come up with those strategies. Mm. Like, we can't sit here and say, you need to do this, mm. this and this, because mm. that's not the way it works. Mm. But if you can involve people in the school setting and you then involve the people in how are we going to address this, that's just as important. So after you've formed some goals and strategies, what does the action team do then? They monitor what's going on. Mm. They meet regularly, mm. they check whether they're, you know, how they're going with all their work. The, the concept of change management, are we actually bringing people along with us? Mm. What is the reaction now? And not being afraid to change course if needed. So it's that constant monitoring. And I think another thing that's really important is when, as soon as we get a success, we need to celebrate Sorry, it. Yeah. 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 And incorporating the F word. Oh. Fun. Yeah. yeah. It's about fun and it's about teamwork. Oh, I don't know where you were going there. <laughs> but look, thank you Not also, alone. Michael, for my sleep bracelet. Thank you for giving that to me Pleasure. for free. <laughs> I'll leave you with this thought from Jared Kintz who wrote, I love teamwork. I love the idea of everyone rallying together to help me win. <laughs>